Good to be with you uh, again. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks since I've been able to be on uh, with you, and it's uh, been a busy couple of weeks. So as we uh, as we open, let's just pray for a moment. God Almighty, we tell you we love you. We thank you for your love for us. And again, Lord, we, we've already prayed that for whoever will be hearing this, that you will open hearts, that you will convince us of the fact that you love us, that you came to save us, that you are dependable. And your only call to reach us is to trust, to believe. Jesus said, just believe. So we pray that you'll help us to just simply trust you. In Jesus' name, in your name. Amen. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to take you to a passage of scripture that I have, uh, by and large, I don't know if I've ever heard a sermon preached on it, actually. Uh, maybe one time about 20 years ago. But it comes out of the first chapter of Colossians. And it's Paul writing to the believers in a city called Colossae. Colossae? I think Colossae. That's how it's, uh, how it's written. In. And he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Paul always opened these, uh, these um, interactions with that blessing. And he prayed that God would give peace. You know, when I think about uh, peace, that's what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, I come to give you peace. Not peace as the world gives but true peace, the peace that comes from God. I think about the old blessing, you know, now may the, uh, the, the peace of God that passes all human understanding guard your hearts and minds of Christ. Over the last couple of years, it's been busy and at times it's been stressful. And one of my prayers over this last couple of years has been for peace. You know, Lord, I'm, uh, I'm 57 years old. I've had lots of adventures. I've um, used up a fair amount of energy in some of those adventures, and I've got to the point in my life where I think if you would ask me what I really want, above and beyond all else, is peace. Because when you're at peace, you you can approach life from a whole different angle. You know, uh, Colossians one twenty says that on the cross, Jesus accomplished peace for us. He ended the, uh, how do you put it, the wrath of God in that time and place for us. He he brought us close to God. He brought us into the family of God. And when you think about peace, it means that peace is one of those things that comes from belonging. Jesus made us to belong. And so from that place, the world can rage around outside, but we have peace. And, uh, yeah, so peace... Peace becomes an important thing, especially to older people. Um, and I'm one of them. So he says, grace and peace to you. Grace is that thing that God gives. Some people, when they talk about grace, they talk about unmerited favor. What does that mean? No, grace simply put is where God gives us what we cannot give ourselves. He gives us what we do not deserve. Um, he gives us his love. It's unearned. I think that's one of the reasons why so many people have a hard time really receiving the grace of God, because they think they have to earn it. If I was to look back over the years as I've interacted with people, especially people that are struggling with lives that are coming apart or lives that are struggling, um, I, I've run into a lot of people that feel that God's angry at them, that uh, you know, sometimes, somehow they haven't been able to perform well enough for God, they haven't been able to please God, and really they, they're spending their lives trying to accomplish something that's already been done. Jesus just simply gives us the grace of God, the favor of God, the love of God. He says, you're clean in my sight. He says, you belong to me. He says, take your rest in me. Um, so when we talk about grace and peace, God is providing us something we can't generate, we can't accomplish on our own. And that's how Paul always invited uh, or opened his, his letters. And he said, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Um, you know, when I think about giving thanks to God, <laughs> gratitude is something that happens when you have received the gift. Gratitude is something that happens when you have received something that, again, you can't generate on your own. And Paul is one of those guys who, uh, you know, talk about adventure. He had adventures. You know, he he worked the then known world. He went through uh, storms and floods and thieves and bandits and all kinds of crazy stuff. And yet he had this thanksgiving. He knew who, whose hands he was in. He knew that God's presence was all around him. He knew that he couldn't go anywhere except that the presence of God was there. 
I remember being in a time in my life when I was really feeling alone. And um, I was a young pastor at the time, and I had burned out, and I was just feeling like I had failed. And I remember one day as I was praying, Lord, where are you? And I, I sensed God saying, I'm here. Um, I've never left. Um, and you got so caught up in what you were trying to do for me that you forgot about me. You know, this idea that God is here, he has not left us. Wherever we are, he is there. I think the psalmist says, you know, do I make my bed on the highest mountain or in the lowest, uh, you know, the, the, the deepest seas? Still, I cannot run from your presence before you are with me. God in his love for us pursues us and he brings his presence to be with us. And as we learn to trust him, it makes us thankful. Uh, it gives us gratitude. And I think that's one of the things Paul's saying, you know, is that um, we give thanks to God but for all the things that are going on in your life. We just simply give thanks to God because we know that it's not up to us to fix anything. God is moving around us and he is coming to meet us in our struggle. So we pray always for you. Paul talks about praying. You know, what do we do when we pray? We point our heart towards God. We put our trust in God. I think prayer, one of the biggest things with prayer, you know, a lot of people talk about the power of prayer. You know, we begin to talk about prayer. Like it's this thing that we do to impress God. To like the more we pray, it's sort of like fueling up the gas tank. The more we pray, the more resources we get. And sometimes the focus can become so much on prayer or on how to do prayer that we lose focus on the one that we're praying to. Again, you know, I think about a lady I, I talked to you know, a number of years ago, and I had taught her a way of praying. And I had given her this prayer. She came back to me one day and she said, I prayed that prayer every day for several weeks, and then I forgot to pray it one Sunday. Uh, and she said, I'm, I, I'm worried that God has left me because I forgot to pray. I didn't pray. Um, and I said, you know, I think, I think you're missing the point. It's not about how you pray. It's not even about having the perfect words. It's about opening your heart to God. It's about turning your focus to him. When Jesus said pray, you know, his disciples came to him in Matthew, well, where is it? Luke 11, 1, and they said, teach us how to pray. And he taught them the Lord's Prayer. The other version of that is in Matthew 6. He taught them the Lord's Prayer, and one of the things that he opened up with is, pray in this manner, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And in that, he spoke about turning your focus to God. And as we're focused on God, as we're focused on the Savior, God's promises, he will pour his grace and his presence and his mercy through us into this world. It's not about the right words. In fact, Jesus actually said that in Matthew 6. He said, don't pray like many of these people around me pray. He said, they think they're going to be heard for their right words, for their many words. Don't babble like the unbelievers, he says. It's not about number of words. It's not about correct approach in that sense. It's about being turned to God and allowing him into your situation. You know, um, I think about, you know, this is hospital ministry. Um, what is the encouragement that we could give anyone in the hospital? Well, in the hospital, you have time. In the hospital, if I've been in the hospital, it's boring. Um, I'm sort of out of control and in the hands of a bunch of other people that maybe I know, maybe I don't know. And in that place, you can give yourself into the hands of God. I remember my father struggling with uh, multiple myeloma, a type of uh, bone marrow cancer. And we just got lost him one time. And as he, uh, we rushed into the hospital, we got into the hospital, they pumped the full extra blood. It turns out he'd been, he'd been hemorrhaging his inside. And they got him stabilized. And, you know, as he, uh, as he was laying in his bed, one of the things he told me later, he said, uh, I told God, I said, you know, Lord, I'm tired of fighting this situation. Seems like all my energy is going into fighting this situation I'm in. I'm done fighting this situation. He said, you can take me or you can keep me here, but I'm yours. And that night was the beginning of the turnaround for him as he regained his health. And we had him for several more years. But that whole prayer, the, the thing of prayer, you know, we pray always for you. We can't fix anything through prayer, prayer. Through prayer, we turn our focus on God Almighty, and we put into his hands the things that we cannot accomplish. You know? 
papers, you know, here's me, like one little kid I got going on is my house sale. I just sold my house last week. Well, God sold my house. My house has been on the market for a lot of months. And I'm watching everybody else get their house sold. And I'm going, God, what's going on? And he says, trust me, trust me, trust me. Well, we just got to the point where probably we're ready to move into the new house and my house sells. And as I look at it now, I'm going, the timing was impeccable. If it had sold earlier, we never would have been ready to get into the new house that we'd be wearing. God cares about such a little thing. And he doesn't want us living in this stress, control freaking, trying to fix something in our life that we don't have the power to fix. And that's what Paul's talking about. He says, we pray for you always. We lift you into the hands of God, the one who can deal with your situation. So this focus on God. And he says this, he says, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for the saints, the faith in Christ Jesus. Paul had heard about these people. And the thing that he heard about them, you know, there are many things you can hear about different people who can hear, uh, you know, how difficult they are, how easy to get along with they are. You can hear um, about their reputation, all that kind of stuff. What Paul heard about these believers in Colossae was about their faith, about how deeply they trusted God. And there's something that happens when you trust God. Paul actually talks about it in Galatians. He says, the more you trust God, the more you live by the power of his Holy Spirit, not by your own strength. And when you live by the power of the Holy Spirit, he says, these are the things that will happen. The things in your life that are of the flesh, the things in your life that are of the world, the things in your life that are of selfishness, these things begin to disappear. They begin to re be replaced by love, by compassion, by mercy, by patience. That's what Paul called in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the evidence that the Holy Spirit is in control. When you trust him, when you believe in him, like apparently these, these Colossians did, the deeper the surrender equals the deeper the freedom. And that's what these people were known for, according to the Apostle Paul. So he said, we've heard of this faith, and not just of your faith, but of your love. The love that is the result of this faith. You know, if you want to love somebody, striving to love them isn't probably the best approach. Because when you strive to love someone, when you try to make yourself love someone, you're trying to change something in your own heart that you don't have the ability to change. When you strive to love someone, again, the words of Paul, the words of Jesus, come back, trust me, believe in me. Um, I think about Jesus' call to repent. And, and repent, I was actually preaching on this last Sunday. Repent literally means to turn back, to return, to come back to the source of your strength, to come back to the one who can do in you what you cannot do in yourself. He can bring peace. He can bring rest. He can bring the comfort. Uh, I think John 16, it talks about, when just, just beyond that, it talks about the Holy Spirit who is the comforter one who comes alongside. So he says, we have heard of your faith and the love which you have for all the saints. It's funny, you know, because I'm actually uh, ministering in context, um, um, church context right now, periodically, where there's been a lot of unloving things happen. And yet, as I minister there, and as we focus more on Jesus, I remember going there, and I remember going, Lord, this is a, a difficult place. It's a place where people have fought one another, but they have not loved one another. What do I do? And I felt like Jesus says, put the focus on me. They've lost their focus on me. So that's what I've been doing. I've been putting the focus on Jesus. And you know what's been so interesting about this? The more deeply our focus has been on Jesus and who he is and on trusting him, the less we want to get our way, the less fighting there is, in fact, there is no fighting right now. And I'm finding this group of people coming back together and rediscovering the love they have one for another. When we yield to Jesus, we begin to see life through his eyes. When we yield to Jesus, we begin to experience the love that he has for us because the scripture says he lives through us. It's quite powerful. 
He says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world, and also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. He says, one of the reasons why we have uh, we, can, we can trust God is because we know in whose hands we rest. Again, I found myself going back to this, my, my father. About three years ago, my father died. And as he died, I, I spent time with him. And I remember a nurse coming in to take care of him. And she asked him, she said, are you afraid? You know, we all knew that he was dying. He was in his final days. And she said, are you afraid? She said, she said we have pills for that. And I said, or I, I'm sitting here watching. My dad said, he looks for him and goes, I have a wonderful Savior in Jesus Christ, and I have no fear. I have no fear. And I watched my father in the last days of his life, and he had no fear. And when he did pass away, I was with him that night. He was very restful. He didn't fight. He was very restful as he went to be with God. My father understood what Paul's trying to get through here. He said, hope, what is hope? Hope is the anticipation of something yet to come. And hope, everybody needs hope. I was ministering with a group of people here a little while ago, and the, the word that I kept hearing from them is, we just need some hope. We don't know how to make life work for us, so we just need some hope. Jesus comes to bring hope. He comes to bring hope to those who have lost hope. One of the ways to lose hope is, again, to lose your focus on Jesus. When our focus is on Jesus, we begin to see things through, again, his eyes. We begin to see in terms of the light of eternity. We begin to understand that, you know what, this life, the situation we're in, is not all there is. There's something good on the other side. If God is in control and he will take us there. Can we just trust him? Someone who trusts Jesus in this way begins to live with hope. And when things come at them, they know that, that, that these things, these life situations, are not the end of the story. And I lived so much of my life uh, working to overcome certain life situations that were coming against me. And I finally realized that if I'm going to continue to live this way, my life is going to be one of ongoing stress because situation after situation after situation will come at me that I am not strong enough to deal with, that I don't have the resources to deal with. I will be battling all the time. Paul says Jesus brings hope. And I trust him. Lord, my hope is in you. That means, Lord, I trust you for the future. That means, Lord, I trust my immediate time, my immediate situation into your hands. This is what Paul says gives us strength. And this is what the gospel brings to us. The good news is that we are not alone. The good news is that we are forgiven. The good news is that we don't have to earn anything. The good news is God loves us enough to seek us out. Romans 5, 8 speaks about how while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the way God demonstrated his love for us. He came searching for us when we needed him the most. So this whole idea of beginning to trust God you know, I, I, I was thinking about an old uh, saying a while ago. And the saying is that God helps those who help themselves. And, you know, there are people that believe that's actually the Bible. That's not how God helps people. God helps those who will trust him. And God desires to help those who are not ready to trust him. He comes for everyone. The question is, will we trust him? Even Jesus couldn't help people that weren't ready to be helped. Will we trust him? Well, this gospel comes and it says we don't have to earn our way. It says our way has already been paid. God has forgiven our sins. He has invited us into the body of Christ. He's given us eternity. And as we trust that, his strength gathers around us. His strength undergirds us and leads us forward. Then he goes on and he says, for this reason also, since the day we have heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you. So Paul reiterates this, the importance of prayer. He says, we pray for you. Like that actually makes a difference. It does make a difference. To have someone, you know, again, I, as I talk about this stuff, memories come to mind. 
I remember a little old lady coming up to me about 10 years ago. She heard me speak in some local church. And she said, Are, is your name Gloria Hopkins? Yeah. Do you know this certain family? Yeah. She said, you're the, you're the same one I've been praying for for 30 years. I picked you when you were 14 years old, and I've been praying for you since then. I was absolutely blown away that this little old lady, having never seen me in 30 years, had been praying for me daily since I was 14. I couldn't believe it. But I think I've seen the hand of God in my life because of her prayer. So we pray for you, and he, and he says, uh, what's in here, what is it says, um, we have not ceased to pray for you, and ask that you'll be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, with the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share the inheritance of the saints in the light. So, as, as Paul talks about this, uh, one, of the, one of his prayers was this. We continue to ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will um, through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. So I got looking at that, uh, that word, uh, wisdom. What kind of wisdom do we need? We need the wisdom of God. The Bible talks about there are several different types of wisdom, and James uh, chapter 3 speaks about them, James 3.13. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor, harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your life, do not boast about it or not deny the truth. For such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfishness, there you have disorder and every evil practice. There are a bunch of different kinds of wisdom. You know, um, I always say, you know, like there's a lot of different kinds of logic. There's, 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 uh, but not all that logic is healthy and not all of it is biblical. There are a lot of different kinds of wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is how to proceed. Knowledge is what you know. Wisdom is how should I proceed in life. Um, and, and the wisdom that Paul warns us about, or that James warns us about, is earthly wisdom. It's unspiritual wisdom. It can even be demonic wisdom, wisdom that comes from the devil. And it will make sense to us, but it will destroy us. It's selfish. It's manipulative. It's all about me. The wisdom God gives is spiritual wisdom. The wisdom God gives is the kind of wisdom that Jesus exhibited when he was ministering among us on the earth. So this wisdom that God gives, um, James 1, it says, any of you lacks wisdom, then I pray. God will give you wisdom. So you know, I find myself, Lord, what do I do with the situation I'm in? And as I turn to him, he says, he, he gives me wisdom. You know, when I get into a conflict situation, I think about some of the conflict situations I've been in recently. There have been times where God's just said, be quiet. Just listen. Yeah, but Lord, I don't want to open my mouth here. Be quiet and just listen. And because I didn't open my mouth, God was able to work in somebody's heart. I was able to speak a little later on. But I was able to hear them. That's what they needed. They needed in that moment to be heard. No, they didn't need my answer. They needed to be heard. And they needed to know somebody cared enough to hear. Godly wisdom. Paul prays for that godly wisdom. And he says, so that you may live a life worthy of God and please him in every way. How do you please God? Again, we oftentimes we think about performance. Well, I failed this, I failed that, I failed the other thing. We think about a woman that I met one time and she said, no, I failed and failed and failed and failed. God is not pleased with me. I believe God is pleased with you. Remember Jesus who said you have to enter the kingdom like, like a little child. What does a little child do? A little child does not perform for its parents. A little child just is. A little child and the parents love it. A little child. God loves us for who we are, not for what we can do. Hebrews 11, 6 says that the way we please God is by faith. You cannot please God except by faith, it says. What does that mean? It means trust Him. Lord, I trust you. Reminds me of a time when one of my boys needed help 
and I just wanted to help him so bad, and he didn't want my help. And finally, the day came when he looked at me and said, okay, Dad, I need your help. And my heart was just full of joy, man. I'm going, I want to be the guy that you come to for help. The fact that my son needed me and admitted that he needed me and had welcomed me into a situation so I could help was huge to me. It just gave me fulfillment. It, it let me know that I was loved. This is what faith is. And this is what pleased God, pleases God. When we decide we're going to do everything on our own and we leave God out of it, the poor God is sitting there going like, you know, I can help you, but you won't receive my help. And he grieves the heart of God. When we allow God in, when we say, Lord, I will trust you with my situation. And I just need the rest in you. It fills the heart of God with joy. And it allows God to do what God has come to do. So as we grow in the knowledge of God, it says that that trusting of God pleases him in every way. Uh, it causes us to bear fruit, uh, to grow in the knowledge of God. The more you trust someone, the more you get to know them. You know, my wife and I just had our 29th wedding anniversary, and we've been together for a long time. The thing I've learned in 29 years with this woman is that I can absolutely trust her. I didn't know that. The first 25 years, I wasn't quite sure of that. I thought, wow, you know, if she really knew what she had married, you know, she probably, she would probably back off. She never has. I finally be, became convinced. How do, you, how do you learn how to trust them? You trust them. You learn how to trust them when you trust them. How do you become totally confident that someone loves you? When you have to trust them over and over again. And there comes a day when you've trusted somebody so long, so many times, that you finally realize they actually do love you. And it blows you away. And this is what, what living in God is like. We grow in the knowledge of God. We grow in not just the intellectual knowledge. The only Greek words, uh, when, when we talk about growing in knowledge, or especially in the Hebrew, the early languages of the Bible, those concepts, um, they meant more than just intellectual knowledge, you know about somebody. It says, we grow in the knowledge of God. That means the participation of God. That is experiential. I have trusted him, and he has come through for me always. And it gives me the freedom to trust him again, to know that he loves me regardless of my failure. And so he does. Paul says, then being strengthened with all power to his, to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. The power that he speaks about comes from God. Jesus taught in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he said that when you, when you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In other words, God hasn't left us to trust him on our own. He says, as you turn your eyes to me, as you depend on me, I will pour my spirit into you and you will receive power. You will receive the strength. I go back to the times when my dad, uh, my memories of when my dad died. When we had a nurse come in, I already told you about her. We had a doctor come in too. Normally doctors today don't make house calls, but this doctor did. And as I remember this doctor, he was so fascinated with the fact that my father had no fear of dying. And he asked him question after question after question. He was not used to dealing with patients who knew they were dying, who had no fear. And... Gradually, gradually, it was, it was quite impactful as my dad described to this doctor his sense of peace. It was the power of God that was poured into his life that allowed that. Jesus has promised us. For those of us who trust him, for those of us who believe in his name, John 1 12 says he will give us the power to be the children of God. He will give us the strength, the ability to be the children of God. We won't have to talk ourselves into this idea that God is faithful. We will know it, and we will be able to rest in it as we grow in that knowledge of God that Paul talks about. So this power Paul talks about, it says, it will give you great endurance. It will give you great patience. Endurance is what? Endurance means you'll be able to continue on and walking through the, the places you need to walk through. You won't fall. You won't give up, you'll have the ability to walk forward. And you will have patience. You won't be freaking out all the time. Lord, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? i, I, I got to get this done right now. Just trust me. Just trust me. And you'll be able to do it. Giving joyful thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. 
we have an inheritance, the scripture says. That inheritance is heaven. So I don't know whatever's happened to you in this life. Maybe you come from a family where you were disinherited and you didn't inherit what you feel you should have. God says your inheritance is in heaven. You get to work with addicts periodically. And as I work with addicts, one of the things that is a common thing among people struggling with addictions is that they burned up most of their relationships, and a lot of them have burned up a lot of their physical inheritance on this world, in this world as well. For them, God says, you trust me, you will have an inheritance, an eternal life. This is what we are a part of. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and he has brought us into the kingdom of the Son, whom he loves, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. He's rescued us from the rule of the devil, the dominion of darkness. He's rescued us. You know, there's a lot of talk lately. Uh, I listen to so many people speculating on the end times, and speculating on the beast, and speculating on the Antichrist, and speculating on all this stuff. And so much of it is just speculation. And the thing that drives me nuts is that I, I, t I talk to people who are so caught up in this stuff that they live in fear all the time. When you live in fear, it means that you don't understand who has adopted you, who has brought you into the family of God. You don't understand the faithfulness of this God who loves you. He has rescued us from the power of the devil. He has rescued us from the power of this earth. And he protects us and he takes care of us. Somebody challenged me a while ago. I was stressing out about something. You know, my life was out of control again and whatever else. And somebody said, has God ever been unfaithful to you? <laughs> I had to stop and I had to look back and I had to go, no, he's never been unfaithful to me. Here I am. Then why am I freaking out again? I found myself having to pray, having to return, repent, right? Return. <laughs> and say, Lord, I'm in your hands. And you know what? Just like the last time you brought me through, this time you will bring me through. I'm ready to be done freaking out. I'm ready to be done trying to control my destiny. I'm ready to trust you. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know in whose hands I am. And it's you. Paul goes on and he writes this. The Son, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. In him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or powers, rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. That is a reiteration or a restatement of John chapter 1 where it says that Jesus is the incarnation of God. And then he says this, he is before all things and in, it all, in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning and firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all the fullness of day as he dwelled in heaven. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on that cross. Sometimes people say, you know, show us God. How, what was God like? And Paul says, look at Jesus. Remember in John 14, one of Jesus' disciples came to him and they said, show us the Father Jesus and it will be enough. Jesus says, have I been with you this long and yet you do not know me? If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. I was talking about this here a little while ago, about this whole idea of Jesus, who is the Son who came to be with us. You know, what Paul teaches is he says, you know, God put himself in the state of his Son, Jesus. And when that cross happened, God tore himself apart on that cross for us. God came and lived among us in the person of Jesus. And he experienced our fear, he experienced our pain, he experienced our hopelessness. He cried out on that cross, Father, why have you forsaken me? What he meant was, not that God had turned his back in the sense of, you know, God was tired of him. What he meant was, God was experiencing in the person of Jesus what it meant to be totally alone. God understands aloneness. He understands lack of hope. He understands despair because he experienced it fully on the cross. <laughs> Somebody said to me one time, why did God throw his son under the bus? What kind of God does that? No, no. God came in the persons of Jesus. He jumped under the bus for us. 
He threw himself in front of that bus, pushing us out of the way to save our lives. He did this in Jesus. This is the God that we have. You know, if you're busy reading your Old Testament, trying to uh, find out what God is like, and you're looking at all these judgmental passages that speak of the judgment of God and all that kind of stuff, remember, John 117, it says, the law came through Moses, the grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What that means is, is it means that Jesus had to come to truly show us what God was like, because Prior to that, they're reading their Old Testament, and they're just not getting it. They're not understanding the love of God. Very few people, David might have been one of them, who wrote the Psalms. David might have understood more of what God was like than anybody. Some of the old prophets, they understood what God was like, but many people didn't understand. Their picture is of this judgmental, angry God. When Jesus says, no, you weren't getting it, I had to come and show you physically. I am the proclamation of God. I am God incarnate. I am God with you. If you want to see God, you look at me. This is who I am. And I love you so much that I came to give my life for you while you were yet a sinner, while you were yet selfish, while you were yet antagonistic toward me. This is God. Through Jesus came grace and truth. Finally, through Jesus, we get to understand who God is. And it says, though you were once alienated from God, though you were once distant from God, though once you were enemies in your minds because of your evil thoughts and behavior, now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present your holy in sight. Jesus has come to collect his people. He is the presence of God among us. I don't even know how to to end this message. But Paul says, if you continue to trust him, you will stand before him. You will be established. You will be firm. You will not be moved. You will have the peace. You will have the strength. Just trust him. Now, I talk about a thing called the drift. And the drift is sort of, you know, I trust God for 10 minutes, and then I decide I'll do it my way anyway, right? God, I'm, I'm trusting you, and if you don't show up in 10 minutes, then I will do it my own. God says, just keep trusting you. It might take longer than 10 minutes. Just keep trusting him. And he's, Paul says, if you continue in that trust, and if you are not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, you will remain. You will get there. You know, I've wondered lots of times, God and his faithfulness and his love for me, he's come and brought me back. And, and over the years, I'm gradually, gradually learning more what it is just to rest in him. I pray that today, as you are in the situation that you are in, that you may hear this message, that God loves you, that God has come for you, that God wants to be your strength, He wants to hold you in his hands. He wants to be your protection. And that he cannot be found unfaithful. He cannot be undependent. So even if you fail to trust him, even if you walk back to your own strength a lot of times like I have, this God who loves you continues to pursue and continues to say trust me. So there's always a second chance, third chance, fourth chance, whatever chance. As we learn to trust God, it's normal for us to wander back and forth until he really he really gets a hold of us until we really learn that there is no other way so god bless you today and may the peace that passes all human understanding may the, the the strength of his spirit may the wisdom of god himself guide you and hold you up and may you know his care in jesus name amen Let's pray. God Almighty, we tell you we love you. We thank you. I thank you for everyone here who hears my voice. Father, as we walk our way through this passage with all the big words in it, but really what it just says, Lord, is it says that you are trustworthy. It says that you love us. It says that you cannot give up on us. It says, Lord God, so many more things. That you will be strong. Father, we love you. And, and to those out there, Lord, that are struggling, uh, trying to master their circumstance. Father, we join together now and we give our circumstance into your hands. 
forgive us for trying to do it on our own. We don't know any other way. Show us by resting you and let you carry us forward. And to that end, we bless you and we thank you and we receive what you give. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.